Hong Kong, a leading financial hub and gateway to mainland China, was once a home to top crypto exchanges. But then strict regulations and COVID-19 changed all that. Now, as U.S. and other regulators tighten scrutiny over crypto, Hong Kong stands out by opening doors to retail trading. Hong Kong's top financial agency, the Securities and Futures Commission, has allowed crypto exchanges in the city to apply for licenses starting June 1st of this year, marking a new era in Web3 innovation. So how will this all play out? Coming up on Word on the Block, Neil Tan, chairman of Fintech Association of Hong Kong, dives deep into those topics and a whole lot more. Once the epicenter of crypto activity was home to leading crypto exchanges, including FTX, Bitfinex, BitMEX, ANX, AAX, besides many others, at one point. And the city emerged as a vibrant playground for crypto, a bridge to the giant economic power that is China. Hong Kong had all the right ingredients, a global financial hub with the brightest minds and the perfect infrastructure to set up shop. Then in 2018, Hong Kong authorities sounded alarm bells on the risks and exposure that go hand in hand with the wild, wild west perception of crypto, ushering in regulatory winds of change. Many exchanges at that point packed up their bags and migrated to friendlier jurisdictions like Singapore and Dubai. And just when the tension was mounting, the world was hit by the pandemic. But the story is far from over. We pick it up right here. Hong Kong remains an ever-evolving player in the digital asset space. The Securities and Futures Commission, or SFC, started accepting license applications from crypto exchanges starting this month, once again opening doors to Web3 players. The city also started a pilot of its central bank-backed digital currency known as EHKD, with high-profile partners such as Alipay, Bank of China, Visa, and Ripple Labs. So what does this all mean? Well, you can't count out Hong Kong just yet. Let's dive into all that is this special administrative region of China and what it's doing for virtual assets on this edition of Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and all the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast. I'm Editor-in-Chief and your host right now, Angie Lau. There's lots of things happening here. And who better to unpack it all for us than Neil Tan, Chairman of FinTech Association of Hong Kong, who led a working group to respond to SFC's virtual asset trading platform consultation. A lot of words to mean they wanted your opinion from the industry perspective, Neil, and you gave it to regulators. And it's, look, it's a really important important part of that that dialogue and it's uh, great to welcome you on the show i can't wait to dive into all of this yeah absolutely thanks a lot angie for having me here catch us up to speed with what hong kong is doing has done and has launched june 1st yeah so essentially uh the government actually issued a consultation paper uh, back in February, March timeframe, uh, essentially 361 pages uh, outlined. And the FinTech Association uh, was one of the respondents inside of that. So we put it out to the members. We have about 30 to 35 members that participated in this working group that you mentioned earlier, uh, of which there were four law firms, uh, international law firms that were inside of it. Uh, from an association's perspective, what we want to do is make sure that Hong Kong is competitive. Obviously, there are a number of different jurisdictions out there, the states, Dubai, Singapore, and so forth, that are also inside of the, the crypto or uh, digital asset space. That's a really important distinction here that, that me too, you didn't want, Hong Kong did not want to be seen as a follower, wanted to be seen as a leader. Do you think that it's getting there with this VASP regulation? and also the trading platform regulation that allows retail investors to participate. Yeah, absolutely. I think if we look at the, uh, you know, the tea leaves, if you will, uh, actually what's happening in the other jurisdictions is, is a pullback in terms of the retail investor access. And uh, Hong Kong is actually going headfirst into this area. 
Of course, there's uh, investor protection and overarching inside of the new regulatory framework. But the fact that we are actively uh, going into this area is a telltale sign of where the future lies for Hong Kong as, a, as it you know, goes after its ambition as a virtual asset hub. In a way, did Hong Kong learn the tough and painful lesson? I mean, the, the retail consumer base was in Hong Kong. They were being served by a number of crypto exchanges uh, a few years ago, and then the clampdown on specifically taking that access away from retail investors and, you know, uh, giving uh, crypto access to only accredited investors. Do you think that that was a painful lesson to learn? Yeah, I think that if we kind of pull it all the way back to 30,000 foot level, essentially um, crypto, China was, uh, was actually one of the key innovators inside of crypto. And a lot of major people, projects, platforms came from China. And when China ended up banning it, it all migrated actually into Hong Kong. Uh, and so, you know, China, the, there are a m- number of different millionaires and also even billionaires inside of the crypto space that ended up uh, providing funding inside of projects and platforms and so forth. So like you mentioned earlier, OKX will be all these other players that are inside of it. And ultimately, they migrated to other areas. Now, from a regulatory perspective, of course, Hong Kong pulled back and saying that, you know, you have to go for accredited investors, professional investors. Uh, and the truth is, is that, uh, you know, that actually uh, reduced the size of the market significantly, especially if you're not addressing retail. Uh, did that hurt? I think a lot of the other jurisdictions also did the same thing. It wasn't necessarily a net negative per se. Uh, in some ways, it was almost a, a me too approach as well. But I think for investor protections, that was kind of the guardrails that they put up in order to ensure that they didn't have any uh, sort of other jurisdictions experience was things like FTX, like Celsius, like Three Arrows Capital, um, Terra, so on and so forth. We're kind of in the midst of writing the second chapter in Digital Assets History Book. Uh, and, and the one about Hong Kong is really interesting because right now in the context of everything, some countries like the U.S. are cracking down on crypto very specifically. Hong Kong seems to be, as you said, setting the rules to ensure that businesses do get licensed and actually have a rule book to operate by. And what's interesting, and, and certainly from your members uh, at the FinTech Association, you know, what is the perspective from even the crypto exchanges and financial firms and service providers in wanting to engage with crypto? Is this an opportunity to set that new standard even for an international class of investors and service providers? Um. Hong Kong is an international financial center. Uh, If we take a look at the uh, size of the opportunity, if you will, Hong Kong has over 4.5 trillion US dollars in AUM or assets under management. Um, And the the other part is as a capital markets, it's uh, number one in the last seven of 10 years uh, in terms of IPO. So what does that really translate into? Uh, Number one is obviously allocation of that capital going into crypto assets. There's also liquidity, which is also a critical piece inside of crypto that a lot of people can, you know, have uh, challenges with, uh, particularly inside of tokenization. And especially if we're moving into the real world asset tokenization space, this is going to be very key. I, I, I totally agree. And, and the, the mood uh, when I travel um, around the world and it's such stark contrast to what I'm watching happen uh, in the U.S. right now, because, you know, there is still this this stink, if you will, uh, and this um, hesitation and apprehension of participating in the crypto markets post FTX. Right. Uh, but abroad, uh, when I went to Dubai and in Hong Kong, you know, the feeling is very much different. And to be able to access crypto in a regulated way and ha- and legally have access to it, that kind of um, ability to diversify into crypto assets, that's a really powerful move that I think, you know, really speaks to the, the desire coming out of the Asia Pacific region. Hong Kong in the last three to four months has had about 200 different Web3 events 
uh, and there's just uh, it's just electric inside of here. So it's just massive interest. Uh, there's a huge community inside of it, um, and it's just uh, how do we take this forward, right? Uh, I think there's a level of excitement inside of it and getting this license in place. Devil's in the details, of course. You know, of course, implementation, execution, and those different things are uh, the next kind of uh, order. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it's uh, net positive for everyone, in, including, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, every time I talk about it, the different ecosystems, the Web3, crypto, so forth, we're still at a very, very early stage, right? I mean, you know, this is a very nascent uh, industry at this point, and there's plenty of room to grow for everyone. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be Hong Kong and you know, somebody has to win, somebody has to lose. I think the entire pie is just going to get bigger, right? So I think this is really huge for us. That's right, especially if, you know, when you are welcoming people AKA more liquidity in the market. The enthusiasm right now of exchanges lining up to register in Hong Kong. Uh, what are they? OKX, Huabi, DBS Bank, uh, a lot. You've got insights into the workings of SFC, obviously. Um, you know, I'm sure you studied every one of those 380 pages, but from your educated guess, based on, you know, what those applications look like and knowledge of the rules, when do you think we can expect the first licenses to be granted? Is this going to be a long extended thing or when do you think the landscape's going to change? So if we kind of break it down, there's actually two incumbents that are already um, having a license, right? So you've got OSL and also HashKey that are already have the institutional license. Then you've got other exchanges that are coming in from existing uh, jurisdictions that uh, you have to consider, and then there's probably net new applicants, right? So the way that I kind of frame frame this whole up, uh, the entire situation up, is almost as a benchmarking exercise to what we saw inside of virtual banking licenses. We're going to be seeing a lot of different players that are coming out. Like you already mentioned, a lot of the traditional, or not traditional, but ex existing crypto is coming in, but also TreadFi is going to be coming in, DBS and so forth is coming in. So well, I, I think there's going to be a number of other applicants, including Greenland Securities, uh, Greenland Holdings, which is out of China, right? So that's a real estate player that has no experience inside of crypto or digital assets, but they've already indicated that they want to apply for the license. So we're going to see a very diverse group coming out of this uh, pool here. I mean, if that is not a signal that China is allowing Hong Kong to be that sandbox, even though domestically within the borders of China, crypto is banned, crypto trading activity is banned, um, that a mainland firm has indicated that it wants to participate and probably be you know, I, I don't want to say probably or conjecture or anything like that, but the fact that there is a, a public desire to do so, um, because a lot of the companies in mainland look to policy as guidance for business strategy, that's, that's just a huge signal right there. I think there's just basically the diversity inside of the group uh, as far as whether that's actually tied to how China views this. Uh, whether they'll authorize the state-owned enterprise to apply and so forth. Um, that's another thing. Uh, but ultimately, I think they've already raised their hand and said they're interested in moving forward on this space and they haven't received any pushback at this point. But uh, I think this actually bodes well and really is a showcase for the one country, two systems policy that's in place, right? Because exactly what you said, crypto is banned inside of China. Uh, here it's completely legalized. It's the sandbox. It's the access point for a lot of this uh, cross-border activity. And uh, China has uh, said, you know, this is the way that we're going to be operating. And it seems like it's been uh, approved in that sense. So I think this is actually very well uh, received. 100%. And of course, there's something on the horizon as well. Uh, hang on to that thought, Neil, because when we come back, I want to talk about Two types of digital currencies hot on the minds of us and regulators and investors in Hong Kong. We're talking about CBDCs and stable coins. We're going to take a quick break right now, but when we come back, we're going to be diving into the world of digital currencies and a whole lot more. Stay with us. 
In the world of digital currencies, Hong Kong is restricting stablecoin trading while blazing ahead with CBDC developments. The highly anticipated EHKD pilot attracted industry giants like Ripple, Standard Chartered and Visa, just to name a few. More when Word on the Block returns. If you don't understand the future, you'll never see your place in it. Introducing Forecast Plus, covering all things blockchain, independent reporting, insights, and access from Asia to the world. We cut through the noise where technology, insights, and access meet, where smart conversations happen. Make friends with disruption. Forecast Plus. Welcome back to Word on the Block. I'm your host, Angie Lau. And yeah, we're going to pick things up right where we left off with Neil Tan. He's chairman of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. Hong Kong has gone from the regulatory space and very interesting things happening there. And I want to talk about stable coins now because there's, there's um, guidelines for stable coins. And it's clear that the SFC is keeping a watchful eye on stable coins, especially after the Terra Luna incident, as we obviously all can remember. Um, and new guidelines say that stable coins should not be admitted for retail trading until they are regulated. Um, give, us, give us some insights here. You know, it's a huge step forward doing the VAP license as it is, uh, accessing, uh, providing access to the retail investors and so forth. I think what they're trying to do is really uh, at this point, just stay with, you know, a large cap crypto. Uh, of course, they're going to be also giving access to altcoins or alternative tokens. All the platforms will have to do diligence themselves. The SFC will not DD those different tokens. They have to come and report back to the SFC for those specific tokens. But stable coins are not on the table at this point. And the thinking here is, is that, okay, stick with crypto as it is uh, without opening up the, the stable coins access and also at the same time launch the uh, EHKD. And they're running different pilots inside of EHKD. Uh, inside of the different CBDC programs and a lot of different participants inside of that particular program. So somewhere around 16 different firms are um, in the pilot and folks like Stan Chart, HSBC, Bank of China, all the folks that are uh, uh, key inside of uh, traditional uh, banking and finance. Uh, but also there are all other players like Visa, MasterCard, also Ripple is inside of it. So. But I think that's kind of the playbook that SFC is approaching it with, is that how do they institutionalize the CBDC space and also at the same time understand the different use cases that they will um, explore inside of this particular pilot. The EHKD pilot includes um, leading names such as, as you said, Visa, MasterCard, Ripple Labs, uh, and even though Ripple is engaged in litigation with the SEC in the United States. So that's that's kind of like a very interesting uh, differential there. But, you know, with the EHKD being pegged to the U.S. dollar, what do you see as use cases and uh, potentially for a global economy? So I think that uh, inside of this particular pilot, what they're trying to do is uh, test out online and offline payments. Uh, they're also working on different types of uh, programmable payments. So if you're talking about leveraging the smart contract technology, uh, this is what they're trying to do. If you if you almost want to call it a, uh, a program, the, the smart contract to make certain payments on, util let's say, utilities or electron uh, electricity or other, that's what they're going to be taking a look at. But aside from that, they're looking at tokenized deposits, tokenized assets. So, you know, to your point, you know, when you talk about Ripple and their participation inside of this pilot, what they are doing is they're partnering with Fubon Bank, which is a Taiwan bank, uh, essentially looking at tokenizing real estate. So it is actually different from uh, what they had originally envisioned Ripple to do, which is pure play payments. Uh, but the tokenization of real estate is what they're trying to explore inside of this particular pilot. So 
But uh, yeah, to your point, exactly. It's very interesting how one jurisdiction is actually uh, in a legal battle with them and another one is actually adopting them as a pilot use case, right? So we're seeing an institutionalized play into tokenized real estate. Uh, But approved tokens, right, undergo strict due diligence, including a one-year track record to, uh, you know, kind of catch the shady operators and, and protect investors. You know, how do you see that kind of diligence being played out? And how are Hong Kong regulators equipped to actually actively close potential loopholes in the ever-changing crypto landscape? Uh, so the SFC will not go down to the to the token levels at that point to authorize, okay, token ABC can be listed on this exchange and, and that exchange. It's going to be on, the onus is going to be on the platforms to do that. Um, and they do still have to report to the SFC, but it's all. It's almost like a formality, assuming that they follow the right due diligence procedures. So uh, ultimately, I think this actually opens up the opportunities for those different exchanges to diversify their offerings to the public. Uh, and some folks are even uh, planning to offer, for example, Sand, because you know uh, Sandbox is in uh, part of Animoca Brands and as a local favorite here, and that might actually give uh, access to the retail investors to uh, purchase and and buy and hold that type of uh, token. So a lot of folks are looking at this as a huge opportunity that opens up the space, but it comes down to implementation, execution, enforcement, and so forth. How will the SFC uh, enforce all the different regulatory framework inside of that space, all the audit, all the due diligence, uh, remains to be seen how that works out. I guess we'll see what happens once the licenses are issued and once other people start applying for the uh, tokens to be listed on their exchanges. We recently saw incidents in neighboring countries to Hong Kong, like the token listing bribery case in South Korea. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you know local authorities, uh, SFC, Um, have an investigator, uh, you know, class to be able to or geared up to, you know, track and make sure that that these things don't happen in Hong Kong. Uh, So at the top side is, of course, the, you know, legal framework or the regulatory and compliance framework that's overarching, which the SFC has introduced. At the bottom side, what I say is like top down is really what that license is all about. Now, bottoms up is how do we actually leverage this type of technology to also facilitate the regulatory compliance piece uh, from a technical perspective? And that's what the SFC is actually planning to institutionalize is the use of different smart contracts in the auditing process as well. So, you know, if you're talking about proof of reserves and they have also a provision that requires a monthly reporting. All those things will be actually built onto the blockchain and also inside of smart contracts so that it is not something that is arbitrary or you know you don't see it on Twitter. And so then the question is, Dubai, Singapore, or Hong Kong, uh, have we we have a, a real close you know leader in EU? Potentially things are happening in London. Have we counted out? U.S. Well, the race to be the next Web3 leader is on. Uh, We're going to take a quick break right now. But when we come back, we're going to see, is there going to be a winner? And who will it be to win the crown for the next Digital Assets Hub? Got to ask the man in the know, Neil Tan. (laughs) Stay with us. In the battle of digital assets powerhouses, Hong Kong stands out with impressive infrastructure, the right talent pool, clear regulations, and exposure to China. But Dubai and Singapore are not far behind. So who wins the title of Digital Assets Hub? More when we come back. Welcome back. You are joining me, Word on the Block, Angie Lau here with Neil Tan. Okay, so um, if I had a bell 
And I, you know, I think we're in the fifth round now. Are we going on the sixth? The fighters are tired, but they're still in it to win it. It looks like Asia Pacific is picking things right back up, uh, really geared uh, to, to engage with Web3 in a significant way, especially as um, we're all watching a very unfavorable and chilling regulatory environment in the U.S. Is it driving crypto firms uh, elsewhere, abroad, and into the arms, if you will, of the Middle East or, you know, Asia or, or Europe? What, where, where do you, th what do you think is happening right now in terms of mood and migration? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you kind of look at it, it's essentially the States has already stated its position. It's going after, you know, sent a Wells notice to Coinbase and so forth. And they're going after a number of other uh, institutions and um, organizations and so forth. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, it's quite clear the direction. So if you believe in, the uh, Operation Choke Point concept that's been, or 2.0 in this sense, that uh, a lot of people inside of the crypto space believe in, then this is the direction that the U.S. is going. There's really three key pieces inside of the space. So number one, I already mentioned the International Financial Center. I think they're, you know, whether it's the 4.5 trillion U.S. dollars in AUM, whether it's talking about the capital markets piece being number one, seven out of the 10 years, that is a huge, huge advantage. And that's something that cannot be built in a year, in 10 years or 20 years. It's built over decades, right? And uh, essentially, there's a level of trust that a lot of the investor group has in Hong Kong and inside of the regulatory framework. The second piece is, is that Hong Kong has been positioned as a arts and cultural center for China. That will be the creativity, the arts, the culture that's going to be uh commercialized inside of this Web3 space. And the third piece is, is really the private and the public sector support. So of course we have all the, the different government organizations like CyberPort and Hong Kong Science and Technology Park uh, who are incubators inside of the space. But we also have like Invest Hong Kong, FSTB, the Treasury Bureau inside of that, uh, that are also supporting in terms of policy and allocation of uh, capital and resources to encourage this type of development. Now, key inside of the public and private is that private piece. And we have a global champion in Web3 based out of Hong Kong, which is called Animoca Brands. And, you know, you're obviously very familiar with them. And they are able to leverage their entire portfolio of 300 to 350 different portfolio companies inside of Web3 to help support Hong Kong to develop this space. So Hong Kong's advantage in uh, developing as a global virtual asset hub to develop as a Web3 hub is at the top of the list because of this holistic strategy, holistic approach in terms of development. So I'm very positive in that sense. Uh, well, if if you're any indication of the uh, insightful, intelligent uh, talent that is uh, prevalent in Hong Kong, I think Hong Kong is uh, in a good place. Uh, Neil, I, I don't say that lightly. This was so insightful, and I super appreciate you breaking down what is really a behemoth of uh, regulatory policy uh, uh, and 380 pages worth of, of guidance um, and breaking it all down for us. So I truly appreciate it. And, and we've been gifted uh, audience uh, by this insight, so I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Angie. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks for having me. We're going to we're going to talk some more. Uh, I'll see you in Hong Kong. And that is a wrap. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this latest episode of Word on the Block. I'm Angie Lau, forecast editor in chief. Until the next time. <laughs>